Welcome everyone uh, to the Drainage and Donuts Tile Drainage webinar series. We are now in um, the third webinar in our series with two more to go. Um, I think some of you have, have been uh, following the series to get your free donuts at the end. I'm sure that's the um, incentive there. But for new people on the webinar this morning, I just want to thank the Northeast Extension Risk Management and Education Grants Program for providing us funding to develop um, educational resources focused on managing tile drainage on the farm. I'm Heather Darby with the University of Vermont Extension, and I'm hosting the webinar today and we'll be introducing our speaker this morning. So the goals for our webinar are to learn about best management practices to use on uh, acres that have subsurface tile drainage. We also want you to learn how farmland with subsurface tile drainage may impact uh, water quality. We want you to learn about end of tile treatments and lastly, increase your knowledge about the Vermont state required agricultural practices um, and new RAPs that will be coming out focused on managing um, subsurface tile drainage. So we are in the third speaker again and happy Halloween to everybody. Um, today we have Eric Young, who many of you know, he used to be at Minor Institute, but has recently moved to Marshfield, Wisconsin, beautiful Marshfield, um, and now works with the USDA Ag Research Service. And he's going to be talking to us today on tile drainage and management from some research that he conducted in New York. Um, and I believe he'll also be talking a little bit about end of tile treatment as well. On Friday, um, we have our fourth uh, webinar presenter, Lindy, Lindsay Pease. She's at the University of Minnesota. She worked um, as a postdoctorate research with Kevin King with the USDA as well. And she'll be talking about their experiences in Ohio. And then on November 8th, we'll wrap up our series. Um, and I'll be presenting on our tile drainage survey results and some of the monitoring that we've been doing here in Vermont. And we'll also hear from Ryan Patch from the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, and he'll be updating us on tile drain rule amendments as well. So remember, uh, for every webinar you attend, you can receive one certified uh, Crop Advisor credit, credit, a CCA credit. And if you're in Vermont, you can also, and you're a farmer, receive your uh, water quality education credit, one per webinar. You can request that online, and if you didn't register, you can contact Susan Brulette with your name, farm name, location, and CCA number. And remember, if you attend all five webinars, we'll be sending you um, a gift card to Dunkin' Donuts to go get yourself one of those cute little spider donuts that they have for the holiday season. Okay, so remember, um, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, and at the end of the webinar, we'll be, I'll be um, asking Eric all the intriguing questions that you folks have for him this morning. So with that, Eric, I am going to turn it over to you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, as Heather mentioned, I'm going to be um, focusing on some tile drainage management. Specifically, I'm going to focus on end of tile uh, treatments. So I know a lot of you have probably heard uh, about some of the work that we've been working on um, at Minor Institute over the past couple of years. So um, I thought today I would really kind of focus on um, the types of BMPs out there that we can utilize to reduce nitrogen um, and phosphorus export from tile drains um, when, um, when it is in fact uh, a problem. So you might recognize the two characters there on the left there, that's Don Ross and uh, Joshua Faulkner. And uh, that was a picture from earlier this summer um, at uh, a site in um, Addison County where they're um, doing end of tile monitoring. So just a quick overview um, this morning, um, just some basic uh, review on tile drainage uh, basics and field hydrology to set the stage because I think that's important before we get into um, the different treatment options available for tiles. 
um, talk briefly about uh, nitrogen and phosphorus loss pathways in tile systems, um, the importance of end of tile monitoring and edge of field monitoring to assess BMP performance, and then um, really go over uh, several different BMPs that are out there and being used uh, to reduce NP export in tiles, and then finally wrap up uh, with some challenges and opportunities that I think are out there. So just real quick, you know, um, I don't think I have to uh, beat this with a dead horse, but right, drainage is pretty important. Um, you know, whether we're talking about urban landscapes or residential landscapes or agricultural landscapes, right? Um, the need to manage water um, is, is, is uh, paramount in our society today, right? So uh, we're just really extending that concept out into the agricultural landscape. So um, whether we're talking about surface ditching uh, or tile drains, um, when we encounter poorly drained soils and um, imperfectly drained soils, we need to, to, to better manage those through um, so through ditching and tiles uh, when we can. So, okay, just a quick review of field hydrology. Um, and I know you folks probably have a pretty good handle on this, but again, just wanna set the stage here, right? So when we're thinking about uh, tile landscapes in the Northeast, um, um, we think about our big components, right? Precipitation, rain, snowfall. Right um, during the growing season, uh, evapotranspiration and evaporation are very large uh, losses of water. Um, in terms of runoff, of course, we have surface runoff pathways, and then we have uh, tile drainage and subsurface uh, water loss pathways where we have tile drainage. Okay, um, and in tile drain fields, we also have you know we have lateral seepage, we have deeper percolation to shallow groundwater. Right? So it's not like the tiles are intercepting all the shallow groundwater. They're really just kind of putting a little dent in, into, into uh, the groundwater table, um, giving, us, giving us some more um, uh, uh, drained soil above that uh, to work with. So um, here's some data that I just want to share with you really quickly to drive home the, the, the point of trade-off uh, with, with respect to runoff. So in tile systems, we tend to see uh, lower surface runoff um, as compared to a poorly drained soil that's not tile drained. And uh, I apologize, this is a little bit busy uh, graph here to check out at um, nine in the morning. Um, but so where this data is coming from is uh, Minnesota. It, um, it's coming over the time period of 1913 to 2011. So it's a, a big chunk of time here, almost 100 years. And um, this is a modeling, uh, uh, modeling exercise here, but it's based on long-term monitoring. So the top, the top graph here on the left is weekly undrained runoff from, from the field that was modeled. And um, this is a somewhat poorly drained uh, Crookston soil. Again, in, we're in Minnesota here. And you can see the weekly undrained runoff volume there on the top left. Um, and then the bottom left, we'll skip across the middle one, the tile drain flow there and go down to the tile drain surface runoff, okay? And so that's the, the weekly drain runoff volume that we would see with tile drains. So, so the top one is, is uh, surface runoff uh, where we don't have tiles. And the bottom one there is um, uh, the reduction in surface runoff there that we see where we have tile drains, okay? So if you subtract the two curves, um, the top and bottom, then you get the middle one there, and that would just be the tile drainage flow. So all this to say um, that we really alter, significantly alter the amount um, and magnitude of surface runoff th that we have uh, when we have tile drains. And this is uh, an important concept to keep in mind um, as we're working um, in these systems, and specifically with things like controlled drainage, uh, where we're um, going to be altering the water table and therefore the potential for surface runoff. Okay, so just to go over uh, some of the, the pathways, the main pathways for both nitrogen and phosphorus loss. Um, so in this diagram, really just showing um, dissolved phosphorus and particulate phosphorus, just as an example. So the red dots are, are simulating uh, dissolved phosphorus, the black dots are, are simulating particulate phosphorus or phosphorus adsorbed to soil particles. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, you know, surface runoff is, is, a, is a dominant pathway for phosphorus loss. And as you know, this is because phosphorus, um, unless very high concentrations in the soil, tends to be bound um, 
to particles and moves with erosion and runoff. So surface runoff is, is a big pathway of loss. Um, now in tiled systems, um, we can have um, some leaching and um, preferential flow of phosphorus, um, either where we have high soil test P or where manure is applied and where we have macro pores or large um, cracks in the soil, right? So this can be from um, no-till, right? Where we're not tilling, we, we tend to um, develop these macro pores or larger um, soils, uh, cracks, excuse me, cracks in the soil. Um, they could be root channels, earthworm burrows, um, anything like that um, that allows the rapid movement of water um, down through the subsurface. Um, and in fact, some of these uh, macro pores can indeed reach tile drains or, or very close to them um, and facilitate uh, the movement of nitrogen, phosphorus, um, bacteria in some cases, sediment down to tile drains. So that's, that is an important process. We tend to see uh, macro pore flow um, much more um, readily in uh, finer textured soil, so clays and, and um, uh, silty clays and, and, and um, soils like that. Um, I want to point out one more thing here. Um, so I uh, see this term called matrix flow, okay? So I just described to you preferential flow or macro pore flow, right? So water flow through large pores, but we also have matrix uh, water flow in soils, and that's simply the water movement through the small pores. Um, and that water movement is much slower and it's much more effective for removing things like phosphorus, okay? So, and that's simply because there's more time um, for those uh, absorption reactions to occur and um, remove the phosphorus before the water reaches the tile drain. Okay, so just a little bit more on nitrogen and phosphorus behavior before we jump into some of the BMPs here. So um, nitrate nitrogen, that's the most highly soluble form of nitrogen. Um, it's plant available. And so once we're in that form of nitrogen, um, uh, it's easily lost uh, through runoff, leaching water, um, and also through denitrification where we have uh, waterlogged soils. Okay. Um, as, as opposed to phosphorus, much less soluble, uh, again, unless we're really up there in the soil test P level, our uh, phosphorus solubility is, is, is much, much lower than, than nitrogen. Okay, um, and as I mentioned, where we have high soil test P or manure application, we're gonna increase our risk uh, of both phosphorus loss in surface runoff and tile drainage. That's an important point, okay? Um, the last couple things here, just to wrap up with, it's important to realize when we're talking about end of tile best management practices, that um, for nitrogen, we're really talking about bioremediation, and um, that is biological reactions to remove nitrogen, okay? So things like denitrification um, and plant uptake, okay? Um, as opposed to phosphorus, which is um, primarily removed by abiotic reactions or chemi chemisorption reactions. So that would be a combination of um, precipitation from solution and um, electrostatic uh, attraction to, um, to particles, okay? So just two, two different mechanisms there. So nitrogen is biologically removed, phosphorus is abiotically removed. Okay, so I can't say, stress this one enough. Uh, good nutrient management goes a long way. So I'm gonna be focusing on uh, what we can do to remediate um, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen and tile drainage water once it gets there. But the best solution, right, to, to, uh, to, to manage this is to prevent, um, uh, to prevent nutrient loss in the first place, right? And so how do we do that? Well, we know, how to, we know how to do that, right? So we fertilize based on crop need, we soil test, we manure test, right? We try not to over apply phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, incorporation of manure is really important. Use of cover crops is also important. Okay, so again, the best thing we can do is try to prevent or minimize uh, the risk of, of nitrogen and phosphorus reaching tiles in the first place. So I, I just wanna make sure that's, uh, that's an important point. Okay, so I'd like to just talk a little bit about edge of field and end of tile. Okay, so these are two terms that are getting thrown around uh, quite a bit these days. So what do we mean by edge of field? Well, we simply mean that we're monitoring a whole field for runoff and nutrient export, okay? And we're, we're monitoring year round. So through snow melt, through winter, um, and we're using a paired watershed approach. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see um, this is a paired watershed um, in the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire. And this is really where the idea of using small paired watersheds in agriculture came from, is really coming from um, these uh, forestry studies 
um, where we have um, you know designated small watersheds um, that we can uh, impose a treatment on and then monitor the water coming out of those um, out of those watersheds to determine the effect okay so end of tile is really an, an extension of edge of field so end of tile is, is simply referring to um, Enge uh, engineered practices that we can use on the end of tiles to, to remediate um, water quality. And just keep in mind that end of tile is really kind of edge of field, right? Because um, the water coming out of the tile represents a known watershed area in the field, okay? So, so they're kind of uh, quite similar. So just keep those concepts in mind. Okay. And I also want to stress the importance of monitoring. Okay, so anytime we're talking about assessing the effectiveness of best management practices, whether it's tile drainage or surface runoff, um, monitoring is just a huge part of that, right? So um, we really need to get an accurate read on the hydrology and the runoff flows um, and uh, couple that with um, the chemistry, right? Um, so we can calculate accurate loads. And that's really important, particularly through um, the winter time, you know, uh, snow melt typically in the Northeast is, is the time when we receive probably more than half of our total runoff for the year. Um, so it's a really important time to be out there. And of course things freeze up and um, right. So you gotta be out there and um, collecting good data. Okay, so let's jump into uh, our first best management practice here, which is co controlled drainage. I'm going to be abbreviating this CD. Okay, and so what is controlled drainage? Well, controlled drainage is simply manipulating the water table in the field uh, by using these engineered structures. Okay, and why do we do that? So we do that because we can um, reduce the total volume of water that drains from the system or from and typically in the Midwest, the way this is done is we uh, hold the water table back uh, during the non-growing season. So say somewhere around November to April 1st, we would raise the gates in these structures um, and to about 15 centimeters below the soil surface, right? And so that effectively um, slows down um, the, the subsurface flow rate from the system. Um, compared to uh, a free drainage tile system where we would not have those um, control structures and the tile would just uh, remain uh, to drain freely, okay? So what kind of impacts can we expect from controlled drainage on nutrient loss? Well, if you look at the literature, and there's actually quite a bit of literature out there um, on controlled drainage over the past, I would say, two decades or so, but we can see up to 80% reduction in nitrate nitrogen loss. Um, and this is primarily due to the reduction in water export, kind of like turning down your, your faucet in your sink, right? Um, so if we're, if we're uh, losing less water per unit time, we're also going to be losing uh, less nitrogen. And that's kind of the, the analogy there. Um, now, there are some studies that have also shown lower nitrate concentrations coming from uh, drainage water management systems or control drainage systems. Um, and we think that's because uh, by allowing that water table um, to be closer to the soil surface, uh, we're getting some more denitrification losses and possibly some more uh, plant uptake of that nitrogen depending on the, uh, the time of year when, uh, when, when, we're, when we're doing that. Um, one major caveat to control drainage here is you need flat fields, okay? So this is why it's pretty popular in the Midwest. You have large flat fields. Um, most uh, engineers recommend a slope less than 1%. Um, um, and so you need to be really careful about that. Um, and, and the reason this is, is because if you have, um, you know, an undulating water table, you really lose control uh, of that uh, of that water table and the ability to to slow down the water. So um, now phosphorus reduction is also possible with this method um, since we're reducing the total water flow. Um, you know it makes sense that we would also um, have the ability to reduce phosphorus export from tiles too. Um, and there is some literature suggesting this. I think um, up to 30% uh, less phosphorus loss from tiles. Um, but there's, um, in terms of the research, there's much more work that's been done on nitrogen and far less 
work that's looked at phosphorus, uh, the effects of uh, controlled drainage on phosphorus. Um, and the good news is, is that controlled drainage doesn't seem to significantly affect crop yield. Um, in fact, on average, it uh, looks like there's a, kind of a no net effect. However, in drought years, there's been several studies out of the Midwest that have showed um, a significant yield bump from um, utilizing controlled drainage um, simply because um, the, the water conservation aspect. Okay, so here's some, uh, some data coming out of the uh, Illinois just illustrating the impact of, of controlled drainage on cumulative nitrogen load. So here I got uh, three graphs here in the top is just uh, precipitation and the middle one is daily flow um, from the free drain tile uh, tile field and the control drainage field. And uh, in the bottom you can see the cumulative nitrogen load. This is in kilograms and per hectare um, over that uh, three year or two year time period. And you can see there there's quite a separation um, between the free drainage and control drainage with respect to the cumulative end load. Um, so the three year means we're looking at um, the free drainage loss 57 uh, kilograms n per hectare. Um, and then the control drain at 17. So you can see a, a really big difference in the amount of N lost um, there in this system. <clears throat> and uh, again, there's no difference noted here uh, between the grain corn yield uh, for this particular study. Um, so another uh, variation on control drainage uh, that some folks in uh, Ontario have been working on is this idea of coupling sub-irrigation with control drainage. It's kind of cool here. This picture kind of shows that. This picture is coming from um, uh, AgriDrain Company. And so what this is, is basically uh, trying to get the best of both worlds. So, um, um, so during times of drought, or let's say you have uh, uh, finer or coarser textured soil with a high water table um, that gets droughty uh, in the summer. So this would be um, the type of system that you might want to consider under those, uh, under those situations. Um, so sub-irrigation is simply uh, pumping water into the tile system itself and then raising that water table up as you're pumping the water in to get the water to the crop. Um, and that's uh, what they've been working on in Ontario. So, so during the summer when it's dry, you can uh, use uh, water from a stream or a pond and pump it right into the system. Um, and then during the non-growing season, you put your gates in and uh, keep the water table up and reduce your flows that way. So um, next slide here, we'll share some data. So in Ontario, as I mentioned, they did a, looked at this for two years and uh, found some interesting results. So the uh, control drainage uh, uh, sub-irrigation treatment had a 64% yield advantage for corn. Now that's pretty astonishing. I um, was very surprised by that. But again, um, primarily due to, to uh, greater water availability and the ability to, to get water to that crop when it needed. Um, so the CDS treatment also had 8% more total drainage, which is not too surprising because we're adding water to that system. Um, but it also had 11% higher water use efficiency, um, which is a good thing. So if we take a look at the flow weighted nitrate uh, concentrations, um, the CD, uh, S system reduced concentration significantly. So we go from 19.2 uh, of the free drainage to 11.3 uh, in the control drainage. So that's a big drop there. Okay, so what about costs of controlled drainage? So um, the water control structures can, can range uh, anywhere from 500 to $1,000 depending on the size that you need. Um, and again, if we're using flat fields, we can get away with one structure for about 20 acres or so, okay? So if we're thinking about CD, we need to be thinking about uh, getting a, a, working with an engineer um, uh, and, and working on a plan and um, getting the money for that and, um, and figuring out where it's gonna go on the land. Uh, so what are some other benefits? Well. What kind of payback can we expect? Well, uh, maybe we can expect some better yields in drought years. That's, that's definitely a possibility. Um, um, we definitely can count on lower uh, nitrogen and phosphorus export from tiles, assuming that the system is properly engineered and is able to reduce that subsurface water flow, okay, compared to uh, the free drainage situation. 
Um, there is a risk that the control drainage may increase surface runoff during the times that we're holding the water back. Um, so that's, that's an active area of study. Uh, we're looking at that, um, folks at Minor are looking at that um, uh, right now and some other folks are also uh, have been working on that. Um, and so ideally what you would do in a CD system is adapt, adaptively, excuse me, manage the water table. So what do I mean by that? Um, so it, as opposed to just, uh, you know, raising the water table during the non-growing season, um, you can actually raise and lower the gates throughout the entire season based on the weather. Um, and that's what uh, is really would be the ultimate way to manage the system. Of course, that's the most work, but um, you probably get the most benefit by doing that. Okay, so let's move into uh, uh, bioreactors, buffers, and wetlands, right? There's a mouthful. Um, so each of these systems relies on biological uh, uh, processes to remove nitrogen. Okay, so um, specifically the process of denitrification. Okay, so when we're talking about bioreactors, buffers and wetlands and nitrogen, we're really talking about the process of denitrification. Okay, and that is the process whereby nitrate nitrogen is converted back to nitrogen gas, okay, uh, assuming that reaction goes to completion. And we need wet soils for that and a carbon source. So that's what you need to remember for that. So that's why wetlands are, generally speaking, natural wetlands are good um, at reducing nitrogen and groundwater. Um, that's because they have waterlogged soils and abundant organic carbon to fuel the microbes that do this work. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind. Now we can also have some nitrogen removal via plant uptake and microbial Im immobilization. Um, but by far and away, denitrification and then followed by plant uptake would be the two biggest nitrate removal mechanisms um, for, these, uh, for these practices, okay? Uh, and one thing to note, if we're using buffers uh, and wetlands, if we're not harvesting the biomass, um, that nitrogen and phosphorus is just uh, being recycled in the system, okay? And eventually we'll, we'll build up and subject to loss. Um, so denitrifying bioreactors. Now there's another big word. Um, so this is a technology that's been around for a while. Probably a lot of you remember the bark beds that we used to use um, in CAFO planning. Uh, to treat milk house waste. So this is where, this is the same idea as that really. Um, and the idea is that you're um, creating a microbial uh, rich environment that, that will um, facilitate denitrification, okay? Um, and so that's what really these de denitrifying bioreactors are all about. So you can see here a little diagram. And this is coming from uh, Christensen and Helmer's um, uh, University of Illinois and Iowa State. Um, you can see a bark bed going uh, in here on the right. Uh, but the key aspect here is um, you need to have control over the flow rate um, into, into the bioreactor, right? So typically these systems are built with controlled drainage structures. Um, you need to have a bypass flow, right? Because under high flow, you obviously cannot, uh, the, the system can't handle that much water and you need to have a bypass. So that's an important aspect to, uh, to, to the de uh, design of these. Um, okay, so here's some uh, data coming from New York. This is a study uh, that Larry Gehring, some other folks uh, at uh, Cornell uh, were involved with. And they were looking at uh, building denitrifying reactors um, to remove nitrogen from tile drainage water. Um, and I believe this was in the New York City water. Um, so this graph's a little busy, but uh, let me break this down for you. So uh, what we're looking at here are uh, laboratory um, reactors. So they first simulated um, the reactors in the laboratory before they um, conducted the field experiment here. So on the left uh, x-axis, you can see the NOx reduction. So that's NOx is simply just nitrite plus nitrate, okay? And in the top panels are uh, concentrations, um, milligrams per liter, and the bottom are the actual loads, and that's in grams per cubic meter per day. So if you look at the top left, you can see uh, the inflow concentration coming into the lab reactors, right? And then you can see that as that incoming nitrate concentration um, increases, we see more um, denitrification, right? So as the concentration of nitrate comes uh, coming in increases, we're able to, um, the, this system is able to denitrify um, a greater quantity 
of nitrogen under those conditions. And that, and that jives with um, other research as well. The other important uh, factor here is residence time. Okay, so what is residence time? So residence time is the length of time the water stays in the bioreactor, okay? And you're probably, probably familiar with this concept. And not surprisingly, the longer um, the water stays in the system, the more effective treatment that we see. And there's a nice linear relationship there between uh, residence time and the amount of, of, of nitrogen that's, uh, that's lost, okay? So those are two important factors to consider anytime we're talking about um, designing these systems is what, what are the inflow concentrations that we expect and what is the residence time, okay? So just a, a couple other uh, figures from this work. Um, so what they looked at, I'm sorry, I didn't break these treatments down um, too well for you. Um, so I'm actually gonna go back here. So the white circles are wood chips. These are hardwood chips, ash. Um, and then the dark circles are wood chips plus biochar. Okay, so you're probably familiar with biochar. So um, so this, this experiment was designed to determine if there was any significant differences between the, the regular wood chips and the wood chips with biochar. So I apologize for not at the outset. Okay, so if we look at the total um, NOx mass removed over the study, you can see that there were some differences here. The, um, the biochar plus wood chips did a little bit better, so removed 54% of the NOx um, that went through the system, so a little over half. So we did get a little additional nitrogen removal with that biochar, um, but it wasn't terribly um, significant. So if you look at these different runs here, the continuous, the low run, and the high run, um, the continuous is really um, just representing the, um, the average flow across all events, okay? And you can see we did see a significant, they did see a significant difference there. And then the low and high runs, um, these were simulated runs with a high uh, and low concentration of, of inflow nitrogen. I think the low run, run was done at five milligrams per liter, and the high run was done at 12 milligrams per liter. So you can see once we get up to that higher um, incoming concentration of nitrate, there's more variability um, um, in the two treatments, which makes sense, right? Okay. So what about phosphorus? So we've been talking about these uh, bioreactors and bark beds for uh, for nitrogen, and they and they're they're pretty effective for nitrate removal. But what about phosphorus? Well, if you look at this graph here. Um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't suggest that these uh, systems are too good for phosphorus removal here. So on the left have, uh, axis, we have dissolve uh, reactive phosphorus reduction. So that's how much the concentration reduction that, that was observed um, in these systems, right? So uh, if, you, if you look at the zero line here, um, that's, that indicates, right, that there was no effect on the dissolved P concentration, right? So just look at how many of those circles fall on the zero line, okay? Um, so that's telling us that it's having no net effect on the phosphorus. Um, so if we're negative, so if we're below zero, then we're actually losing phosphorus from uh, the, the bioreactor to, to the tile water. So you can see in several instances, uh, um, this system's actually acting as a source of dissolved reactive phosphorus. So um, so the take home point here is that um, these bioreactors with wood chips may be good for nitrogen reduction, uh, but not so good for dissolved P. Okay, so taking a look at um, removal efficacy um, of the wood chip bioreactors compared to some of the other practices, um, this helps just kind of put it, put it into perspective. So on the left here, we have the percent nitrate nitrogen load removed. And there you can see the wood chip bioreactor, just, just under 40%, um, similar to controlled drainage um, and, and constructed wetlands. And in fact, none of these practices uh, are above 50%, right? So um, no free lunch. These are all, um, you know, these are all helpful, but there's no silver bullet here. Okay. I'd like to take a couple minutes to talk about saturated buffers, okay? So these, again, are... Um, being used fairly extensively in the Midwest. Um, so what is a saturated buffer? Well, it's kind of just what it sounds like, right? So, so a saturated buffer is simply where we're taking that tile drainage water and redistributing it on the top of a riparian buffer, 
okay? So in a tiled system, um, one of the disadvantages, even if you have a riparian buffer, is that the water table is, is low enough where it is not um, effective to have that water go through the buffer, right? So it's bypassing riparian buffers. Um, in tiled landscapes, right? Because most tile drains are at four feet deep and that's keeping the water table down. And so when that water is flowing, right, to uh, off the field to a riparian buffer, it's deep enough below the soil surface where it's not interacting where uh, with the upper soils where we want it to, to remove nitrogen, right? So, so we really want that shallow ground, groundwater to be up closer to the soil surface in riparian zones where there's more organic carbon and more microbial activity um, to reduce that nitrogen um, load, okay? So by using these saturated buffers, we're able to collect that uh, nitrate laden tile water and redistribute it using these lateral pipes that you can see there the distribution pipe into the riparian buffer to maximize that uh, denitrification process and so this is really kind of a cool process um, and the other advantage to this system is that um, if it's designed properly you don't need a, a pump right so all the system can run via gravity and uh, that's a tremendous advantage uh, so here's just a quick picture uh, of the location. This is uh, coming from work out in the Bear Creek uh, watershed in Iowa um, with Dan Janes. Uh, I was at the ARS out in uh, Iowa. As you can see here, uh, their series of wells that they had and uh, their, their basic setup where the uh, control box was and things like that. So uh, I just have one graph here. So on the left here, uh, they were able to calculate the infiltration in meters squared per day, okay, that's infiltrating into that saturated riparian buffer. So that's what the blue diamonds are. And then that green line is just simply the cumulative nitrate end load um, over time. And what I don't show you here is the, the concentrations in the wells, but um, they effectively saw 100% end removal from the system, which is, which is just astonishing. Um, so they weren't, uh, all the nitrate that they measured on the inside of the buffer um, was below detection limits. So they effectively were removing all of the nitrate that they were delivering uh, from the field to the buffer um, in this study. So this really um, looks promising um, as, a, as a BMP for reducing uh, nitrate in these landscapes. Um, so similarly, uh, constructed wetlands have been around for a while now and um, They've also been used to treat, you know, um, wastewater from wastewater treatment plants, as well as agricultural runoff, including surface runoff and tile runoff. Uh, so this particular uh, data here is going back uh, several years, um, coming out of Illinois, where they looked at three different constructed wetlands and um, their ability to remediate nitrate, nitrogen, um, and tile drainage water. And on the left here, you can just see the basic design. Um, and on the right here, uh, you see a plot of uh, total nitrogen loading um, by total end removed in the wetlands, okay? And that dashed line is a, is a one to one line. So you can see that um, we're, we're much less than 50% uh, removal, uh, but again, it, it's not insignificant. So these, these removing 37% of the total nitrogen that came into these wetlands was removed. So still uh, a lot of nitrogen being processed in these wetlands, um, and, um, but again, uh, much less than half. So just keep that in per, uh, perspective. Um, um, in terms of phosphorus, uh, this is some more bad news for phosphorus. So only 2% of the inflow dissolved P was removed in these systems. So very ineffective for phosphorus, but effective for nitrogen removal. Just a couple other things about wetlands, they're uh, expensive. Um, so this is my one and only slide on constructed wetlands. Um, there can be a lot of regulatory issues with these um, and they're expensive. So um, not to say they're not viable, um, but maybe they're not quite as competitive as some of our other uh, end of tile BMPs. Um, if we look at the cost per pound of N removed of some of these practices, um, I find this to be quite useful. So uh, figure A here on the left, this is a cost. Um, and it's in um, cost per kilogram of nitrogen per year. So that's the units. 
And you can look here across and see uh, for control drainage, bioreactors, uh, and wetlands. You can see the differences here. Now the, uh, the white bars are, are the um, equalized annual cost. So that's just basically the, um, an economist way of, of saying that's the, um, uh, the cost uh, per year. And the gray uh, bars are costs with government payments, okay? So as you know, there's EQIP, there's CRP, um, things like that that can help farms pay for some of these practices, okay? So that's just taking into account um, uh, how much less it would be if you can get government payments, okay? Um, so one thing to note here is on the left, so I mentioned the controlled drainage bioreactors and wetlands, you can see the different costs per pound. So, um, you know, you get a, a, a big bang for your buck, um, uh, for, for, for bioreactors and controlled drainage, right? Um, and obviously it makes sense to, to, uh, to get federal money if possible, right? Um, and I, I think it's important to keep in mind the cost relative to some of our other nutrient management-based practices. So on the right-hand side, you can see uh, cover crop, crop rotation, and spring nitrogen application, right? And that would be moving from fall to spring. And that's actually a negative cost, right? And why is that? Well, that's because it makes the farmer money, right? So by applying nitrogen in the spring, not in the fall, you're saving more, you're getting more nitrogen efficiency. So it's actually a negative cost, right? So that would actually be um, a profit. So that's the way to kind of look at these graphs here. Okay, so I wanna spend a little time on uh, phosphorus removal structures. So, so far the practices we've talked about have not been good at phosphorus removal and I'm getting most of my time, so I'm gonna to have to speed up a little bit here. Um, so Chad Penn at the University of Oklahoma, who's now with USDA ARS, uh, was really the leader in uh, designing these. And uh, what's pictured here is a phosphorus removal structure. And it's really, uh, the, the design is actually quite simple. Um, this particular structure has steel slag um, as the phosphorus um, absorption material and it's uh, around six to 11 uh, millimeters in diameter. Now this particular um, structure was built on a golf course and um, show you some of the data that they've gotten out of this. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so while these are uh, built for golf courses and things like that in residential areas, uh, they are also expanding these um, for tile systems. So that's just the, uh, what the, what's pictured here is that you can design these systems to treat uh, tile drainage flow. Um, and Dr. Chad Penn literally wrote the book on this. You can see here, um, um, there's this book available that uh, tells you everything you need to, to know about designing these structures and things like flow rate, residence time, particle size of the medium, the different types of materials that you can use. Um, so, just wanted to point that out. So here's uh, a phosphorus uh, absorption structure going in in Minnesota, I believe, um, and a really big one. So again, these are being utilized, um, and I think we'll have to wait a few years to see how these um, start performing over time. One thing to note about these uh, practices as is the life expectancy, right? So whereas controlled drainage and saturated buffers and wetlands may have a lifespan of somewhere around 20 to 40 years, um, these structures would have a much shorter lifespan. Um, and that's because uh, the phosphorus, right, as it's being removed, um, it's, it's accumulating on those materials, right? And you need to take those out and change those, okay? So this graph here just shows you um, the phosphorus removal efficiency on the y-axis as a function of the cumulative amount of phosphorus added to the system. Okay, so you can see here uh, a really tight uh, relationship that as, as our uh, phosphorus added to the system increases, we really um, start to drop in our uh, uh, phosphorus removal effectiveness of the material. So that's just something to keep in mind with these, um, that you know, they will have to be managed um, if, uh, if they're utilized. Another quick graph uh, just showing you the, uh, another important aspect of these structures is that the flow rate uh, through these structures, right? So um, sometimes we get heavy rainfalls, right? Sometimes we get really heavy rainfalls. Well, um, under those situations, as we alluded to with some of the uh, systems for nitrogen, our efficacy decreases under higher flow events, right? So that's simply what this graph is showing is that 
as our uh, you know average flow rate increases for any given runoff event, um, we're we're proportionately uh, removing less phosphorus, right? And if you think about that, that makes sense, right? Because the residence time is shorter, right? Under high flow, we can't um, maintain uh, that slow velocity that's needed to remove the phosphorus in, from the system. Okay, so here's a chart I just put together. Now take this with a grain of salt. Um, this comes from um, a lot of the different literature sources that I reviewed to put this talk together. But I wanted to try to give you guys something that you could kind of take home um, and that was practical. So I just have the different tile BMPs here, uh, the approximate cost per acre. And as I said, there's a lot of assumptions here. Um, the nutrient that's uh, effective for, the relative efficacy lifespan, and then the NRCS standard. So each one of these I should point out there is an NRCS standard for each one of these best management practices. Now, that doesn't mean that um, every state has one, because um, they don't. Um, some states have these and some states don't. Most of the Midwest states are, um, have, uh, NRCS has standards for all these practices. So it's just something to note. Um, so I don't wanna go through this. Uh, we pretty much hit all of this, um, but I just wanted to put it in one table for you guys. And uh, so hopefully that's helpful. Okay, so wrapping up here. So what would be uh, the cat's meow here? Well, could, could we design a system that could remove nitrogen and phosphorus from tile drainage water in one system? Uh, so that would be uh, useful where, where, um, we, uh, where, where needed, right? And so uh, this particular study looked at combining wood chips and um, steel slag. Um, and this was done at the bench scale in the laboratory. Um, but they found really encouraging results, you can see in the bottom. So for, for in terms of nitrate removal, they uh, found anywhere from 53 to 100% nitrate removal, depending on uh, retention time. And that was at an inflow of 20 milligrams of nitrate. So that's pretty high concentrations um, and uh, retention times of six to 24 hours. And they also found fairly good phosphorus, phosphate removal um, in the um, steel slag somewhere. Uh, so under continuous flow, they found um, removal of 3.7 milligrams of P uh, per gram of material. So that's pretty good. Okay, so just wrapping up with some key considerations here. Uh, so what's the concern? Um, is it nitrogen, is it phosphorus, or is it both? In many cases, uh, in the Northeast and Midwest, um, we're getting, we're concerned about both. So um, I think that's where we're headed, whether it's surface runoff or tile, um, we're really concerned about both nutrients. Uh, we wanna take a critical source area approach to this, right? We don't wanna just go out and willy-nilly apply BMPs. Um, we really wanna target our most, our highest risk fields and really, um, we should use sampling to make sure that it is a problem. Um, agronomic practices, definitely important here, right? Uh, can't emphasize that enough. We need to, to use sound agronomic practices um, um, because that may be uh, all we need, right? We don't wanna engineer a solution for something um, that could be done just uh, by doing better nutrient management. So proper design engineering is critical. Um, the financial, financial aspects are huge, right? We need to plan for those. Um, and then uh, this final bullet point, just uh, regulatory compliance versus demonstrating BMPs. You know, I think it's important um, to be proactive as a farm. Um, you know, you can uh, do this because you're uh, made to do it or mandated to do it, or you can, you can be progressive and show people that you're trying to do the right thing and demonstrate some of these BMPs. And uh, that goes a long way. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip over these last few slides. Um, I let, I'll let you look at them, I guess, on your own. I want to save time for questions. Um, and with that, um, I'll just end on this final slide here, uh, just some challenges and opportunities. Um, I think we always need to be thinking about optimizing crop nutrient applications, okay, whether we're talking about tiled or non-tiled systems, okay? So incorporating manure, soil testing, um, and applying what the crop needs at the right time. Um, I think we have a lot more research to do here on these BMPs. I think we have to start looking at things like no-till. How is no-till going to affect, you know, macro pore flow to tiles? And might we need more of these end-of-tile BMPs and long-term no-till systems? That's a possibility. 
um, and an active area of research. We need to get better tools to predict NP loss risk. Um, and again, engineering is critical for these practices and we need to work with farmers um, for solutions. So with that, I say thank you and we'll uh, entertain any questions you have. Great, thanks Eric, that was awesome. It was really uh, packed full of good information. Oh, good. And um, we do have a few questions coming yep. in. So everybody uh, knows the drill, type your questions into the chat box or the Q&A box. Right now I'm going to launch the uh, quick polls. So if folks could answer those questions, um, it's really to gauge if you're learning anything from our webinar series and if you're planning to maybe implement um, any of the practices uh, that Eric talked about today. So that would be great if people can enter that. Um, <clears throat> I have one, well, we do have a few questions. So we can, we can start with those while people are answer, answering the quick polls. So one question was, um, can you share what model was used for the long-term runoff volume uh, with and without tile drainage? Ooh, good question. Um, I think it was drain mod. I think they used drain mod. Just D-R-A-I-N-M-O-D, like one yep. word? Okay. One word. Yup, and it's uh, it was that's been around a while. It was uh, from North Carolina State. So came up with that. And, um, it's actually a free program. It's available online. Okay. North Carolina State developed and free online. I'm just typing it into our. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see here. We have how wide were the saturated buffers? Oh, good question. They were established buffers, and I believe they're pretty wide because they made they were designed to NRCS specs. So do I, have, I might have the paper right here. I think it was at least twenty meters, if not wider. Um, let's see, you know, it had the the grass, the the um, the shrub um, section, so. Yeah, it was at least 20 meters. I'm not finding it. I have the paper right here, but I'm not seeing. Um, so that's a good question. It was established and it was pretty wide. I want to say it was all of tw it was 20 meters at least. Okay. Good enough? Yeah, I think so. Jennifer, you can let me know if that's not good enough. <laughs> and I have the paper too. If any, if any of these papers, I have all these papers. So if anyone wants them, I can send them to you. So we'll be posting the webinar, Eric. I, I'm not sure if Susan asked you if we could post it, but oh yeah, with no your problem. permission, and then you have your citations on there, so people can go and oh, look point. those yep. up. Right. Okay. Yep. So uh, somebody asked, why do we want denitrification? Hmm. Good Doesn't question. it produce N2O? <laughs> so good question. So if it, it can produce N2O. So if that reaction doesn't go to completion, yes, we do get N2O. And that and that happens. It happens in ag soils, it happens in wetland soils. Um and so two parts. So denitrification isn't good if we're trying to get nitrogen to a corn crop. But if we're trying if we're talking about getting rid of excess nitrogen right, nitrate that's leached to tiles, then the ability to, to get rid of that nitrogen through denitrification is a good thing. Um, and yes, if it goes to completion, it goes back to N2, so then we don't have a greenhouse gas. Uh, but my understanding is you're always gonna get some mix of N2O, um, NO, and N2. So if denitrification goes to completion, we don't, we don't create greenhouse gases. But in reality, we always probably get some. So yeah, no free lunch there. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and another question is, can the saturated buffers be harvested? Ooh, good question. I think that depends on your state. Um, I know that in New York, some of those willow buffers that they use are harvested. Um, I'm not sure in Vermont if you guys do any of that. So I think it's, it depends on the state. I mean, it certainly makes sense from 
uh, nutrient removal standpoint to to harvest the saturated riparian buffers. I think the ones in Bear Creek, they are not harvesting though. Pretty sure they're not harvesting, but that it would make sense if okay. possible. All right, are there any, any other questions for Eric? So far, I think we've answered all of them that people have asked. Um, somebody asked about if the webinar will be posted. Yes, we're posting the webinars. I put our website up there. Um, we have a few more to go. It takes us about a week to kind of process them um, and get them up on, on our website. So just be patient if you don't see them, they will be there eventually. Um, our next webinar again is on Friday with Dr. Lindsay Pease. So we'll be talking more about tile drainage research. Um, Eric, is there any anything else you didn't uh, say but wanted to say? Ran I out appreciate, of appreciate the invitation. Okay. And um, if anyone has any follow-up, please just shoot me an email. And, okay. Uh, you know. Eric, what's your email so I can type it in for folks? It's, it's eric.young mm -hmm. at ars.usda.gov. Okay, so I'll put that up there. Now, hold on one second. I have a Halloween surprise for you. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> hold on. <laughs> if oh, anybody boy. has ever wondered what I have in my office. As you can see, everything. <laughs> but hold on one second. I have something special for Eric. Oh, really? Can't wait. Oh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> awesome. Yes, this is a, a badger straight from Wisconsin. <laughs> I knew you'd appreciate it. He's, I it's, love it's, it. It's not Bucky, if you're familiar with him at this point, <laughs> um, but it was his cousin. Anyway, happy that, Halloween. Though. Hold on one hey. second. Don't mess okay. with the claws, man. <laughs> All right, so awesome. for those of you who didn't know, I am, a, I am an alumni of the University of Wisconsin in Madison and was a badger at one time, and my in-laws brought me that mounted awesome. badger as a gift <laughs> and it floats around the office serves um, multiple purposes but i thought you would appreciate that okay well everybody unless <laughs> i don't think there's any more questions after that um and uh have a great day happy halloween to everyone and uh hopefully we'll see you on friday thanks very much eric appreciate oh you're it. welcome thank you yep okay bye bye <laughs>